All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, latest episode of uh, Scrubbing the Skies, the uh, webinar series of the Institute for Responsible Carbon Removal at American University. As always, I'm your host, uh, Will Burns. I serve as uh, co-director of the Institute. One of the, the uh, acronyms that's on the lips of virtually anybody in the carbon removal community these days is MRV, right? Short for measurement and or monitoring, uh, reporting and verification. And uh, this has obviously become a, an extremely important issue from a standpoint of the integrity of uh, carbon removal claims, as well as uh, the business model and the policy uh, implications of uh, selecting from the standpoint of the policy community what uh, CDR uh, approaches should be prioritized. Uh, but while a lot of the focus in the last couple of years has been, and necessarily on technological aspects of MRV in terms of how to establish uh, uh, reasonable standards, how to ensure uh, that we truly can uh, measure and verify uh, some of the claims that are being made. An equally important consideration in terms of all the factors we talked about before, integrity, uh, uh, the business case, uh, policy choices, are the issues of cost. And uh, there's, uh, to date, uh, been very little uh, done to, to analyze uh, uh, specific costs of specific approaches, as well as how we might uh, try to bring those costs uh, down. And fortunately, uh, we now have a new report uh, that, uh, that really uh, starts to establish the foundation for these kind of inquiries. Uh, this report, which is entitled Towards Improved Cost Estimates for Monitoring, Reporting, and Verification of Carbon Dioxide Removal, was very recently released by the Grantham uh, Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. And I'm pleased to have uh, two of the authors from that report to join us today to summarize uh, the results of that report, as well as to uh, answer uh, your uh, your questions. And so thank you everyone in the audience. And uh, please, uh, during uh, the initial interventions by the respective speakers, uh, populate uh, our uh, our uh, chat box with, uh, with your questions. And then we'll get to them in the second half of the webinar. So let me initially introduce our, uh, our speakers today. Uh, first is uh, Josh Burke, who is a senior uh, visiting fellow for our very institute, as well as a senior policy fellow for the Grantham uh, Research Institute, and uh, also associated with the London School of Economics. Uh, our other uh, guest is Leo Mercer, who is a policy analyst for the Grantham Research Institute and is also affiliated with the London School of Economics. Uh, welcome, uh, Josh and uh, Leo, to, uh, to the show. And uh, with that, I will uh, uh, pass the baton to, uh, to Josh uh, to uh, uh, provide an initial overview in terms of the report. Josh? Fantastic. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, just wait for the slides to load and then we'll we'll jump straight in. Okay, super. So um looks like everything's set. So yeah, we're we're here to present uh our new report entitled Towards Improved Cost Estimates for uh, CDR MRV. This was released last uh Thursday. So this is the the first preview to a wider audience of the results. So look, very much looking forward to to the discussion. So we'll briefly discuss what we mean by MRV and why it's so important, but I'm just gonna briefly recap a bit more about MRV and then I'll dive into, into the report itself. So um, monitoring, reporting and verification is, is, is absolutely critical to ensure that CO2 has been captured from the atmosphere and stored durably, and it provides the credibility and transparency that are critical to driving growth and innovation in CDR. And Will touched on this. There are many notions um, of what the M in MRV actually stands for, a measurement or monitoring, and they're often used interchangeably. For the purpose of this report and, and for this discussion, we use uh, monitoring for, for, for M, um, and that is taken to include all data and information that is measured, estimated, or quantified for the purposes of tracking CDR and its related impacts. 
And specifically, this report defines MRV as the process of measuring and quantifying CDR, um, uh, measuring quantifying CO2 removals from a CDR activity and monitoring those CO2 removals over the course of a CDR activity. And then it's reporting on those removals and receiving third party verification of the, that the removals have been reported. I'm just going to pause there while we get the, the screen sharing uh, sorted. Okay, there we are. Thank you. Uh, so uh, when we say MRV is critical to scale in the industry, I'm going to just give five reasons why that is the case. So the first, perhaps most importantly, it's the first step of integrating CDR methods into climate policies, markets, and targets. It transforms the CO2 removed into a tangible commodity that entities can then sell and monetize. The second reason is that it can ensure the requirements for liability transfers are met, which is important for scaling the industry. The third is that it allows stakeholders to hold project developers accountable. And then it can also drive much needed investment in research and development um, for early to mid stage CDR companies. And also it provides the feedback loop to support learning and foundational science. So it's absolutely critical uh, for scaling the industry in a way that's credible. So we're just going to go back one side, if, if possible. So there's a few areas we're going to talk about in today's presentation. So we're going to go through the objectives of the research, the data collection and how we went about it. And then I'm going to hand over to Leo, who's going to talk through the results of uh, the report, including how much MLV actually costs for different methods, both in absolute terms and relative terms. Then we'll provide insights from the survey, which showed um, which surveyed participants' views on whether they thought MRV was a, was a barrier to scaling. Then we'll look at the, the relationship between uncertainty and cost, the qualitative results from the survey, and we'll finish with the recommendations and key messages. Okay, next slide. Right, so the, the objectives of the research. So all of this started with a conversation about a year ago when I was in America talking with um, some CDR companies, and, and one of them one conversation really struck, which was um, that MRV for this particular company cost 70% of their total cost of removal. And that kind of got us thinking about, you know, maybe this is a real big barrier to scaling companies in the future. And so what can we do about that? So this is really how the, um, uh, re the, the research question was conceived. And also when I was, last year, I spent some time in, in, in the UK government and they were thinking about designing subsidy programs for CDR, and they had a research question, um, a knowledge gap they wanted to fill rather, which was if they're designing subsidies for CDR, do they need to make a specific provision for MRV within the design of those policy mechanisms? So these are the kinds of questions that got us thinking about this. So with that in mind, we set about trying to establish uh, a, a MRV cost baseline, the different CDR, CDR methods, both in absolute terms and relative terms, assess whether specific support should be included within CDR policy frameworks, whether specific carve-outs for MRV needed to be uh, designed, understand how MRV cost and stringency can be balanced. And I think this is a really critical question as jurisdictions start developing um, their MRV policy from, from scratch. How do they manage to, how can they do this in a way that doesn't, um, uh, that is pragmatic, but also doesn't uh, lose environmental integrity, but it also doesn't burden businesses who are trying to scale, particularly if those relative costs are particularly high. So this is really important for policymakers. Then the fourth objective, and this is slightly more on the academic side, we wanted to inform the literature on um, uh, regarding economic assessments for the time value of carbon. And by that, I mean, there's a, a, a small but growing body of literature uh, that looks at how to use economics to value um, how the temporary versus permanent nature of carbon storage. And within those equations, uh, there's a, assumptions about how much MRV costs. And to date, those cost estimates for MRV have been at 5% of total costs. So quite, quite conservative. So the aim of this research is to feed into that because it will then change uh, how we think, how we value temporary versus 
permanent storage from an economic perspective. And that's a real live debate in the UK who are looking to potentially use uh, these economic assessments or economic valuations to create equivalence ratios, whereby you might say um, three temporary credits equal one that credit, for example. And that change in the assumption on MRV cost may change that, that ratio. So that is another area we, we wanted to feed into. And then lastly, we want to make recommendations for how governments can manage the trade-offs relating to cost and accuracy to ensure that MRV approaches, uh, um, a wide variety of MRV approaches remain viable. And particularly here, you know, when we think about the methods that have long-run scalability and also uh, store carbon durably, particularly in, in the oceans, they also happen to be some of the most uncertain pathways for when it comes to MRV. So if you really want to scale them, how do we um, how do we get comfortable with the uncertainty so that these paths or methods remain on the table? Okay, next slide. So we, we started this project in January of this year, and we then launched a survey in April. So we had a number of responses from a variety of countries across, across the world, um, India, the Netherlands, the US, UK, Canada, Australia, Germany, uh, and, and a couple others. So we had quite a, a nice coverage um, geographically. In terms of responses, we had 58 responses, but only 19 of those responses were usable in that they gave us detailed MRV, uh, answered detailed uh, responses to the MRV questions. In terms of the methods, we had a very good spread of methods, but a, a particularly shallow response, uh, a shallow pool of responses. So all the major methods were, were covered um, with biochar having the most responses. Uh, as well with uh, two responses from ERW, Direct Ocean Captured DAX. BEX as well, the one method we don't have covered in the results. Of the results, uh, or of the responses, we the majority of responses were for companies at TRL level nine, so that is uh, the most mature end of the spectrum, um, and just 11 responses from companies at TRL level four. And as I said, we had a very small uh, sample size to draw from, and that's partly a reflection of where the industry is at today. It's a, it's a very um, um, emerging area and companies either can't share the information or don't have the information. So it's still, it's still a very difficult area to, to tease some of these questions out. So to, to compensate for this, we then um, went through all the frontier um, uh, AMC project applications, many hundreds of those, and, and went through them all to tease out where there might be cost MRV cost information within the uh, frontier application so that we had something to compare our data set with. So it's, it, it's a bit of a robustness check to show, you know, there are uh, to, to make the data set slightly larger. So rather than merge the data set as well, we, we compare our data set to a frontier data set to see what the changes are. And so Leo will go through that, but just, just a couple of caveats about some of the data uh, before we, we launch into it. So as I said, approaches to MRV are currently in a, a very dynamic phase. And as diverse companies scale and MRV protocols develop, the threshold for projects today compared to projects in a couple of years time could be very different. So for example, the data um, that will be accumulated to develop and calibrate models here, I'm really thinking about enhanced rock weathering where uh, model data is, is not used yet um, compared to, to field measurements, but also decay curves for biochar. Once those uh, more information is gathered about that, it might allow companies to move to more model-based approaches, which will be cheaper. So. What I'm trying to say is that the future cost of MRV could be very, uh, could be much lower if they can leverage the model predictions rather than conduct expensive modeling. So, given this context and how little data there is, the MRV costs presented here are just a snapshot today. Um, but um, we hope that it gives the basis to start a conversation about where there might be certain barriers to scaling CDR methods. Um, uh, and uh, start that conversation about how policymakers might bring those costs down. One of the further one further caveat just to say is that what we aren't able to determine is what the system boundary is for each 
uh, that each company is using. So we what we might be comparing on the cost basis is slightly different assumptions on the system boundaries. So we, we have to you know make that clear to everyone that what we are comparing on the costs, there might be different assumptions embedded in there. And whilst uh, the, met the data isn't statistically significant, it provides that starting point to assess whether MRB costs are intrinsic to the method or are likely to change over time as policy and technology develop. So that's the kind of me setting the scene. I'm gonna hand over to Leo who will talk through some of the results in more detail. Great, thanks a bunch, Josh. So I'm gonna be presenting, um, yeah, the data uh, from our survey uh, and also contrasting it with um, the Frontier Advanced Market Commitment, uh, as Josh mentioned. So this is um, this figure shows the absolute cost of MRV for uh, the Grantham data set, where we have nine, um, nine data points, and for Frontier, where there were 32 data points. So we for Frontier, we had data from 2022, 23, and 24, and we took an average um, of those um, of those data points. Um, and where there are at least three data points were presented, um, a high, a low, and an average, um, an average. And where there has just been one, you're just seeing um, one dot, you're just seeing the singular data point. So across the spectrum of methods, um, only six um, had data uh, from both Grantham and Frontier, um, and only Enhanced Rock Weathering and Biochar had enough data for a range for both data sets. So as Josh mentioned, um, we're dealing with um, yeah quite sparse data, unfortunately, but hopefully this will improve. Um, so what is most clear is that marine biomass sinking um, has a huge range and huge costs of MRV per tonne removed with 248 pounds per tonne as the average, um, but an upper estimate of 607 pounds um, and a lower of 37 pounds per tonne. Um, now I know I'm dealing with a mainly US audience, so the current exchange rate is one pound um, to $1.30 US, so try and keep that in mind as I go through these. Um, but the next highest absolute cost for enhanced, uh, enhanced rock weathering with 148 pounds per tonne, direct ocean capture with 112 pounds and uh, uh, DAX with 63. So all of these figures were from the Frontier data set. So our Grantham data set was marginally um, cheaper um, in terms of MRV, um, except uh, in situ mineralization. So um, the data sets were converged most closely uh, for biochar where Grantham, we have recorded um, a seven pound average MRV cost and Frontier um, at 23 pounds per tonne. Um, and then for in-situ mineralization, um, where we record 32 pounds per tonne and Frontier is 15 pounds per tonne. So um, our Grantham data set also has two incredibly um, low um, figures for MRV, that's um, ocean fertilization of one pound per tonne and DAX as well, two pounds per tonne. So um, yeah, just just a reminder to um, we're dealing with um, yeah, a small data set. So take some of these um, results um, yeah, with a pinch of salt. Um, now moving on to the relative MRV costs. So this um, expresses the cost, oh, sorry, the costs are expressed as a proportion of MRV within the total cost to remove one tonne of CO2. So to begin with, soil organic carbon uh, from the Frontier data set um, has relative MRV costs of 67%. Uh, marine biomass sinking is next on 43%. Um, and then the third highest uh, is enhanced rock weathering, also from um, the Frontier data set uh, with 31%. Um, so the data sets once more were closest for biochar with 9% from Frontier and 7% from Grantham. Um, but interestingly, um, high absolute costs didn't always equate to high relative costs. So this was true for direct ocean capture um, where there were absolute costs of £112 uh, for Frontier and £24 for Grantham. 
uh, and then only 6% relative cost for Frontier and 15% for Grantham. Um, additionally, uh, for the Frontier data set, uh, direct, direct ocean capture uh, had the third highest absolute cost um, and then the fourth lowest relative cost um, out of a sample size of 51. So, um, and the inverse was then the case uh, with soil organic carbon. So this provides an indication that where we'd be best targeting um, research and innovation funding to reduce MRV costs are for those methods that have both high absolute cost and high relative costs. So data from our survey and from the Frontier data sets indicates that these methods might include marine biomass sinking um, and enhanced rock weathering. So um, we can go back and discuss um, these figures um, later on in the Q&A, um, but uh, I don't know, I've just thrown a lot of a lot of figures at you, but um, the average across um, the Grantham data set was 12% um, MRV per um, tonne removed, and for Frontier it was 23%. So this equates to, um, as Josh mentioned, the 5% figure, um, which is um, what was included um, in a techno-economic assessment of CDR um, in a paper by Niall McDowell in 2022. So at the very least, it shows that we should probably be nudging those estimates up um, a little bit. So moving on, um, we asked our um, participants um, whether or not they believed that the cost of MRV was a significant barrier to scaling their carbon removal company. So you'll notice that this um, figure has 28 responses because it was earlier in the survey. So generally there were mixed perceptions that MRV was a cost to, to scaling, oh, sorry, was a barrier to scaling. Um, and where it was perceived to be um, a barrier to scaling was for geochemical methods um, and marine CDR methods um, who, who saw it as a um, more significant um, and coincidentally, those methods also had the highest MRV costs as well. But for conventional land-based biological methods, um, the forestation, reforestation, biochar, uh, and DAX, this was, um, MRV was considered less of a barrier to scaling. So in, in aggregate, 28% of our respondents disagreed um, with the statement at the top of the slide, 11% strongly disagreed, and 18% strongly agreed that uh, MRV was a significant barrier to scaling. We then asked um, our participants uh, to rank um, the largest barriers uh, to reducing MRV costs. And there was um, substantial coalescence around two barriers. So this figure shows the amount of times um, the barriers at the bottom of the uh, of the figure were ranked um, um, either number one through number six, uh, with one being the highest. So regulatory uncertainty was ranked seven times as the number one barrier and four times as the number two barrier. And then a lack of standardization between jurisdictions regarding minimum quality standards for CDR. Um, and MRV practices uh, was ranked six times as the number two barrier. Uh, and interestingly, um, lack of equipment and technology wasn't really seen to be um, a barrier at all. So obviously the kit is there, but it's the it's the regulatory um, and regulatory underpinnings um, helping to uh, scale the uh, the CDR industry, which is considered to be the biggest barrier. So the following slides um, provide an overview um, per method of what um, of, of what barriers were considered to be um, uh, the, uh, the, the most burdensome in terms of scaling at their companies. So ocean alkalinity enhancement, um, this was slightly different to what was presented on the previous slide and for enhanced rock weathering and modeling complexity uh, was considered um, to be a substantial barrier in addition to regulatory uncertainty. Um, where it is for DAX, uh, once more, this was regulatory uncertainty and standardization between uh, jurisdictions and a similar, um, similar finding also uh, for biochar. 
moving on to afforestation and reforestation, a um, bit more of um, a mixed bag here, uh, but regulatory uncertainty and um, lack of standardization between ju jurisdictions was also um, also substantial here. Um, and then the final um, figure on the right hand of the slide, um, a bit chaotic as we tried to um, merge a whole bunch of methods into there. Um, but a similar um, a similar story um, as in the aggregate graph. So this slide here um, details the relationship between uncertainty and the relative cost of MRV. So the Frontier data set asked um, in some of their advanced market commitment uh, project applications, the discount factor uh, that um, companies will apply to their tons. Um, and we also asked a similar question as well. So we plotted um, this discount factor against the relative cost of MRV. And apologies for um, sort of the mess at the bottom left-hand corner, um, but there are a few findings that stand out here. Um, mainly that for some methods, um, marine biomass sinking, enhanced rock weathering, um, there's over 30% discount applied to tons removed and potentially up to 40, 50, and then 75% up the top as well. Um, and so in the center of the graph, um, this marine biomass sinking with um, around a 40% relative cost of MRV and a 40% discount factor, that um, should be um, somewhere where policy um, is honing in on to both reduce those uncertainties and reduce the costs as well. But what's difficult and what we tried to ask in the survey, but unfortunately didn't really get um, clear, um, clear results was what the incremental cost to reduce these uncertainties are is. So we asked some fairly detailed questions about um, how much investment in sensors or modeling capacity or lab space could reduce MRV uncertainties by, uh, but Companies um, at this stage um, of the CDR um, industry's growth don't seem to have a good handle on that yet. So that's um, an area where um, where we will and we hope others will will focus on. So we also had a qualitative um, aspect of our survey, um, and across the sample, um, our respondents mainly um, identified OPEX heavy operations. Um, this is mainly due to field work. So field work at sea for direct ocean capture, um, data collection in the field for afforestation and reforestation. Um, and where uh, respondents identified CAPEX heavy operations, um, this was for um, setting up laboratory space, investing in sensors um, and new uh, instruments and so forth. Um, going back to the previous slide around resolving MRV uncertainties, those companies that did have a handle on on on, on what investments um, could yield in terms of uncertainty reductions um, is largely related to um, new sensors and investment um, in instruments. Um, and increased field surveys um, could potentially reduce um, uncertainties by 90% for one respondent. So just to conclude, um, I'll run through my um, our policy recommendations. So these are um, UK focus in the main, um, but we believe there are lessons to be learned for all jurisdictions. So the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero uh, should prioritize the harmonization of MRV practices and principles between jurisdictions as much as practicable, uh, while also not stifling innovation, both in CDR itself and in the development of MRV protocols. Um, we believe that there should be greater transparency um, at all uh, throughout the supply chain um, and support should be made available for data sharing infrastructure in order to make large data sets and simulations publicly available. Uh, the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero should develop support mechanisms through dedicated um, CDR innovation funds. Um, and where, and this should also be adaptive to the different needs of different um, carbon removal methods. So where there's CapEx heavy operations, 
Um, there should be tax credits made available and for OPEX um, heavy operations, um, a mechanism to defray those labor costs um, which pervaded. Um, we also um, have advocated for digital MRV becoming the norm across all CDR pathways. Um, SDOs and jurisdictions should develop um, or should adopt conservative approaches to crediting um, using probabilistic thresholds and conservative discounting. Um, DESNES should um, develop, well, this is our more sort of novel and policy recommendation, but with um, advocating um, the development of some sort of framework whereby um, MRV providers um, can be graded in relation to minimum standards, which will be developed by the UK and the EU um, in order to ensure a race to the top for quality. Um, but then if um, providers don't meet the mark, they should be given time to um, rectify and ensure al alignment um, with the minimum standards. Uh, and economic approaches to valuing temporary storage should move towards method-specific MRV cost assumptions. And so just to finish with the key message, uh, key messages, um, as we've shown with our small sample size, um, collecting detailed cost information on MRV for CDR is a challenge. There's little information publicly available and those companies that do know it um, find it difficult to share, um, largely as, as a result of commercial considerations, but many companies just simply don't know what their MRV costs are and how those are gonna change over time. Um, as such, um, MR, approaches to MRV are currently in a dynamic phase of iteration. So what I have shown today will likely change tomorrow. Um, so um, we'll just need to um, keep researching this and keep publishing this um, and making um, data on um, MRV costs um, as transparent as possible. Uh, there are large variations in the cost of MRV and between CDR methods. <clears throat> um, MRV accounts for 50% for some methods and up to 67%. Um, so policymakers will really need to um, hone in on those methods, on those methods which have both high absolute costs and high relative costs um, in order to reduce those. Because MRV is obviously um, um, a substantial part of that. So not all CDR projects consider the cost of MRV to be a barrier to upscaling. Um, and those that do have high relative costs um, and are largely um, open system mar uh, marine carbon removal methods um, uncertainty about future government regulation um, and lack of standardization between jurisdictions remains a, a worry and a barrier, um, but potentially something um, where there's a bit more of a positive news story as the UK and EU and other jurisdictions are obviously um, developing um, jurisdictional CDR and MRV guidelines. Um, and some uncertainty over quantifying um, the net removals with MRV is inevitable. But where these incremental costs to reduce uncertainty are too high, um, we should be um, using conservative assumptions um, to underpin issuance. So that's um, the key messages. And um, and yeah, thanks for listening. Um, and yeah, happy to take some questions now. All right. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Josh and Leo, for uh, th that presentation. And uh, we'll move to the uh, the, the Q and A phase uh, now. And I'll I'll ask a couple of questions to to seed the conversation, and then we'll uh, move to uh, audience questions. And so uh, I definitely encourage you now to uh, populate the Q and A box to uh, uh, to facilitate that. Uh, so. And a, a couple of a couple of, of of thoughts I had on this. Uh, when you uh, your your methodology was to query uh, uh, companies that are engaged in this, uh, I'm wondering if it would be valuable in the future to be querying uh, either uh, governments that might be engaged in providing uh, uh, funding for for individual approaches or procurement and or procurement or uh, buyers about uh, their opinions in terms of uh, MRV costs and whether they view this as 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 a barrier in terms of purchase. Do you think that's that's an important aspect to capture also and one that we can capture? Yeah, absolutely. So in one of our recommendations, we say that 
and we don't want to be too strong about this, but governments should at least consider that if they're using public funds to um, support CDR, a condition of that might be that the companies provide non-commercially sensitive MRV cost data or other data that might be useful to researchers or others in the field. So yeah, absolutely. I think our intention with this, given, I think the reality is we're a bit early on the research. You know, if we done the start of this in a couple of years' time, we probably would yield a, a greater depth of results. But you know, we kind of wanted to start the start the conversation. But our intention is at least to try and repeat this so that we have something to to see to see how costs evolve over time. So we we have that in the frontier data set, twenty years twenty two, twenty three, twenty four. Even though the data points are very uh, there's a small number of them, we can start to see emerging trends and that's what we want to do. So yeah, future surveys might also con consider the government as well. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about uh, the development of, uh, of regulatory uh, guidelines or regulatory standards, and you cite in the report uh, what's emerging in the European Union, for example, and the United Kingdom, and uh, there is some uh, uh, impetus for that in the United States. Also, I think that's I think that's salutary. I think that both helps ultimately in terms of integrity and and providing investor certainty. But the trepidation I have is that you may have the same problem that you have with the the uh, the uh, standards organizations right now right which is that there'll be substantial differences in these methodologies that won't ultimately create any more certainty uh, i don't know if this is a fair question but do you have any sense looking at the landscape of how governments are developing these mrv standards now if one there's relatively relatively uniform uh, uh, standards uh, across these jurisdictions, and two, if there are efforts at coordination among uh, jurisdictions to try to ensure uh, more regulatory certainty moving forward. Do you want to take that, Josh? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I think this is the big worry. It's kind of double-edged sword in many ways in that governments are starting to develop um, guidelines and protocols and that's exactly what industry wants the danger is that they do it in a way that is uncoordinated and misaligned and i think that is a very real danger i think particularly in the uk there's a sense of trying to do you know uh what the uk does is is better than everybody else maybe and we'll go and try and design our own mrv protocols from scratch and that could end up with something that very is very different from the eu CRCF. And I think the government are very aware of this. They sent representatives to the expert meeting recently in Brussels on to the to the CRCF. So they're very much trying to see what is going on in other leading jurisdictions. But I think, you know, if if the government, if the UK government at least are very are serious about this, they will look at the areas where there's the greatest demand and supply for CDR, making sure that the UK is, is aligned with that so that companies don't just decide to relocate to somewhere else where the, the, the conditions are more favorable. So it's definitely on policymakers' mind, but there's a kind of politics that supersedes that about, you know, maybe moving faster and being more bespoke, and that then could lead to the slightly more divergence in standards as you outlined. So uh, it does worry me a little bit, to be honest. Yeah. Do you think it might make sense in the long term for uh, a, a, an international body, <laughs> namely Paris uh, to uh, to intervene, uh, uh, maybe riding on the IPCC's efforts right by 2027 to uh, try to establish some uh, uh, standards in this context. It might it make sense for for the for the climate regime ultimately to establish uh, uniform international standards, or do you think that might be a bad idea, or do you think politically it's not a viable idea that various jurisdictions are going to want to uh, uh, carve out their own standards. Yeah, I mean, I can only really speak for the UK, but I think the UK will want to go it alone. You know, they in in the short term they're thinking about BECs and DACs initially being integrated into policy frameworks, and for that they already have the regulatory underpinning. For mm -hmm. That that is the sustainability criteria for other 
uh, frameworks that for CCS and biomass, and they can kind of build off those. So I think that's the direction of travel in the long run. In, 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 a, in a, you know, slightly looking down the line, I think, you know, there's a big question about whether the UK and the EU re um, reestablish formal links between their emissions trading schemes. Um, and that might seem sort of tangential, but if we're in integrating CDR into emissions trading schemes, which the UK and the EU are doing, by definition, those standards will have to converge. So I, I kind of see the UK and the EU almost not, you know, not deliberately, but by the kind of broader sort of policy um, convergence, then that filters down into CDR and MRV policy convergence. So I think that you know, assuming that happens, that integration happens in the future and that convergence between the UK and EU's compliance markets happens, that will dictate a much more closer alignment, I think, on MRV, I hope, at least. All right. Okay, I'm going to move to uh, uh, to audience questions, of, of which we have a number. And I'm going to start off with uh, a question from uh, Greg Rao at uh, Planetary. Uh it's a question about biomass sinking. I was I was kind of fascinated to to see. I know it's a, a obviously a limited uh, database uh, at this point, but uh, some of the some of the, the the cost estimates for MRV right and and the fact that if if I'm not reading the report incorrectly, the cost estimates actually had increased in the in the last couple of years as opposed to some of the others. Is that correct? Yeah, yes. I'd have to. You're right with that one. Yeah. Um, so Greg's question is, uh, why would biomass sinking MRV be so much more expensive than ocean fertilization MRV since biomass sinking is uh, central to uh, to both? Yeah, well, I'll hazard a guess, um, but given Greg's from Planetary, I'm sure he'll have a, a much better handle on the answer than I would. But um, I imagine it's just down to how novel the method is um, and the fact that th this company, we actually don't know who the companies are who provided this information. Um, perhaps they hadn't developed um, sensors, cameras or so forth or, or models um, to actually um, uh, predict the total removal. So this is perhaps related to um, just the fact that we haven't been able to understand the um, the temporal scale um, of these MRV costs. And so uh, this company might have um, um, made an answer, uh, given an answer of um, potentially 600 pounds per ton, and they might be in the first five years of scaling their company. So um, this is a point in time. Um, but yes, I take your point around. Um, it's not exactly intuitive. Um, given the um, same delivery mechanisms um, as with ocean fertilization as well. So for some of for some of these responses, we just don't know. We we um, haven't been able to follow up with um, uh, the respondents because it's an, an anonymized survey, but um, just serves to um, to highlight that we're going to need to uh, keep looking into these issues. Okay. Uh, next question from Alec. Uh, Loon, and I apologize, Alec, if I mispronounced your last name. Uh, why do you think companies don't see MRV costs as a significant barrier when they are over 50% of costs for MCDR methods like OAE, ERW, and biomass sinking? Do you as experts think MRV costs could be a significant barrier for development of MCDR? So as Josh said at the top of the presentation, our um, expectation for this um, for the survey and, and and this piece of research was that for all methods MRV would be considered um, um, a barrier to scaling. Um, but as I've shown in the slides, this was mainly only the case um, for marine carbon removal. Um, so that so and those methods also had um, some of the highest costs as well. Um, but we we're a bit surprised that um, this wasn't the case um, across the entire sample. So um, even yeah, as as the as the questioner points out, for those methods which, which do have um, costs of over fifty percent, um, I, I can't give a precise answer off the top of my head 
but it didn't correlate one to one um, with having high costs as well. So obviously, for a lot of these company companies, um, it's it's something else. It could be um, um, aligning with standards or regulation, or it could be could be labor or um, procuring materials and all that sort of sort of thing. Or they also um, can foresee that um, the the high costs um, that they're facing at the moment um, won't be the case in the future. They're surmountable and they'll begin to come down. Sorry, bit of a bit of a scattered answer, but basically for a lot of these, um, it's it's a bit hard to hard to understand. Okay, uh, next question uh, from uh, an anonymous attendee. Uh, and so you're going to you're going to need to access a slide for this one, I believe it says, could you please show the ERW barriers again and share any more information here? Yeah, so I can touch on this. So, um, yeah, modeling complexity was the biggest barrier to reducing MRV costs. And this broadly tallies with our conversations with with folk in, in the sector and some of those working on the protocols themselves in that um, at the moment, some of the uh, protocols or standards such as isometric, they don't allow uh, models to be used yet. And it all has to be uh, expensive in situ modeling. So I think with the ERW in particular, it's one of those methods where we might see a steeper cost reduction than others because once we calibrate the models in a in a more robust way, um, it will allow companies to move from modeling, sorry, move from sampling uh, in person to these more model based approaches. Um, so that's kind of um, one of the insights we we have from this. So it really speaks to um, governments and academics and those working in this field to to try and make those models more robust. But that also requires more sampling to be done. Um, and an appreciation of, of the conditions that are very, very changeable and heterogeneous in, across areas where uh, the projects might be developed and how the models account for that. I think it's a challenge because the, the conditions that could be very, uh, very different. So yeah, modeling complexity, uh, a big barrier for ERW, but uh, we expect that to change quite quickly, I hope. Uh, next question. Uh, do you have a sense of which CDR methods have a more standardized uh, MRV method at this point? I can take this one. Um, my sense is that uh, this is largely land-based biological methods, um, conventional CDR um, as they're largely termed. So afforestation and reforestation, um, MRV is built on perhaps over a century of forestry science. Um, so there's a good understanding of, um, you know, tree growth and carb carbon accumulation based on climate, soils, um, stems per hectare, and so on. So there's a lot of understanding about the variables which can lead to um, um, carbon accumulation and obviously um, um, a lot of remote, um, remote, remote sensing um, can be used to... Um, to uh, detect this over time. Um, soil organic carbon as well. Um, I, I believe that those have, um, there's in, in our previous um, ecosystem mapping exercises, there were, I think, 15 soil, soil organic carbon sequestration protocols um, that we recorded. So there's, and that was the most um, across all CDR methods. So, um, there's yeah so that gives me a sense that there's um, a lot of standardization um, among those two methods um, but yeah obviously the the novel um, carbon removal methods DAX, BEX still innovating um, and developing at pace um, and there's much less standardization um, with those novel CDR methods. All right um, next question from uh, Chris Vivian at uh, Gazamp. Uh, I am astonished by the low cost for ocean fertilization MRV. We're returning to that. <laughs> I would have thought it would be on the uh, on the highest cost. Can you say anything about what this low cost is is based on? Uh, it's very difficult to say, and it, and it surprised us to be honest. Like as as we as we 
the st start of the presentation with you know a conversation with a CDR developer in, in in America where the MRV cost was seventy percent. That was a uh, a marine uh, MCDR process. So I was expecting that to be replicated across other types of method within methods within that category. So I think we were both quite surprised when when we when that result came in. But because the survey is anonymized, we can't follow up, and um, it's just impossible to say. But I. I I th obviously, we have to include them in the survey for full transparency, but we also probably think it's prob an unrealistic uh, data point in, in, in some ways. Yeah, I, that's that's why I'm thinking in the in the longer term, probably the the uh, uh, the the mapping of both what what the estimates are of of developers in terms of whether MRV is a barrier with with buyers, right? Uh, will 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 maybe maybe help iron that out a bit, but uh, yeah, it is a it's an interesting point. I'd love to see what they what they incorporated into that MRV process. Uh, let's see what else I have here. Um, one one question that I had uh, associated with with discount factors, right? I I mean I think this can can end up being a an incredibly valuable uh, uh, method to uh, to facilitate uh, integrity and and maybe still sales of, of some of these approaches that may have higher levels of uncertainty than others. Uh, assuming, of course, we can uh, we can confidently predict those those error bars, right? Uh, which which is a big if. But assuming that. Um, uh, when you, I guess I have two questions in this context. One is, in in your surveys or your other research in this context, um, have you seen extensive use of this discount factor? And uh, and second of all, would you contemplate that that discount factor would probably be used primarily in the in the compensatory uh, realm as opposed to I think what you call the the catalytic realm in terms of purchases? Yeah, so I guess the when we see discount factors at the moment, they're predominantly for land-based CDR when they're operationalized in public policy through the contribution to buffer pools or things like that. That's kind of a uh, uh, implicit discount factor, if you like. It's sort of slightly crude if that discount factor is the same for all CDR projects within that policy. But, you know, where there's a method-specific buffer call buffer pool contribution that's one way of operationalizing the kind of discount factor but beyond that we haven't really seen it um, being used yet but it would be for compensatory uh, claims within public policy I think and it's a good way I you know some I think we have to get realistic that we'll never have absolute certainty for some methods but we need to keep, keep them as viable as possible so how do we do that and so one of the recommendations we put forward in the report and it might be slightly controversial is that for each cdr method we should be trying to set out what we think that error bar is what are the probabilistic thresholds for each cdr method and then credit accordingly on that basis so you know that way we can have methods that can still make money even though there's a high um, uncertainty inherent to that approach and until we have and those you know those thresholds can be updated as science evolves and new evidence emerges but i think that's the only way we can start trying to monetize with some you know monetize these cdr methods where uncertainty still exists so yeah it doesn't it's not really extensively used yet but it's one we're trying to socialize that as an idea in this report for policymakers to then maybe think about All right and so uh, who who would ultimately uh drive the the setting of those uh, discount factors so I think it would have to be a government-led approach. I think that's the only, that's the only way, in my opinion, for uh, for this to have that that rigor and credibility. Because obviously, there's a lot of you know the discount factor is inherently political as well. You know, right? Intensive uh, consultation and lobbying about how high or low that discount factor should be. So I think it's it's it has to be absolutely credible. And I think at this point in time, it needs to be led by a government. Okay. All right. Next question from uh, anonymous attendee. Uh, given that data has been collected from countries in Asia as well, 
Uh, has there been a difference in MRV costs between Europe and the USA versus uh, Asia and other uh, jurisdictions? I, I can take that. Um, yes, uh, without diving back into um, our database, uh, we had two respondents, uh, one from India and one from Indonesia. Um, and from memory, um, they were cheaper uh, on average um, than respondents from the Netherlands, Germany, UK, and so forth. So, um, but kind of hard to um, make make any um, strong conclusions just based on, on on those two data points. Okay. Uh, as 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 we're getting toward the end, um, uh, I'm curious. If uh, if you uh, if you contemplate that this will be an an ongoing uh, research project for uh, for for you for Grantham et cetera, and uh, if yes, in future incarnations, uh, what do you contemplate will uh, will uh, will be added to in in the process beyond obviously updated uh, data? Yeah, so. It's almost a question what would we subtract i think you know when, <laughs> when we designed the server i think we thought you know we'll throw lots of stuff in there and i think we probably scared off some respondents i think that. we had over 30 questions and that was yeah lesson learned too many and extremely technical uh, yeah so perhaps it's a question of um slightly streamlining it but um making sure we repeat the same things that we were we found interesting this time so the costs the uncertainty things that we can track as key indicators year on year. So the intention is is to try and do it again. I don't know what the frequency is, but if there's any people on the on the webinar who would like to respond in the future, do, please do get in touch. Um, but yeah, we would like to do it again because I think there is a merit uh, in starting to track these costs on a on a uh, annual basis. Yeah, would if I can just say it, yeah. So I would, yeah. would like to standardize the survey approach so that we can see that cost curve over time. Uh, but also add in um, questions about um, the system boundaries on, of the projects themselves so that we can feel more confident in doing an apples with apples comparison um, rather than our very obviously apples and oranges um, um, uh, figures that were presented today. So, but we did this through Qualtrics and it's quite hard to draw out extreme, yeah, you know, that's a, a half page answer at minimum on the system boundaries. So, um, we'll have to think about the best way to elicit those responses. Okay. Um, another question, when uh, under the rubric of of regulatory uh, barriers or regulatory uncertainty, right, which was obviously played a prominent role in the in the perceptions of a lot of a lot of the respondents, you get a sense of of how they defined that term? What did they perceive as regulatory barriers or did you define it in the survey for them? No, we we didn't define it uh, in the survey. Um, yeah, I and I'm just trying to remember. C can you add anything to that, Josh? Yeah, so we didn't we didn't define. I don't think we defined it, but in our, in our own mind, at least it's um, let's take the UK for, as an example. There is still not a government uh, designed uh, regulatory framework for MRV yet people have to be credited in in the v, in the voluntary markets and then companies don't know yet um, whether that 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 what they're being credited against there will be interoperable in a UK standard so I think it's that sort of compliance voluntary transition and whether what is um, relevant and allowable in one is allowable in another. Mm hmm. So in many ways, it's it's not as as much in some cases, it sounds like it's not as much as a regulatory barrier as a an absence of regulation. Right. And 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 a benefit of having regulation to facilitate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So regulatory. Yeah. It's, it's almost the opposite, really. So mm -hmm. regulatory uncertainty is a call for governments to be much clearer about what expectations uh they want to have from from CDL companies. Yeah, I I think that's an important uh, important point and, and an important thing to for for people to remember that that 
regulation, which I know a lot of times is anathema, especially to companies, uh, is sometimes is an important facilitating factor, right? And I think in this case, it, it, it clearly could be. So uh, I hope we see more of that. So with that, uh, we have reached the top of the clock. And I would like to once again, thank uh, uh, Josh Burke and Leo Mercer for uh, uh, excellent uh, explication of their report and, and helping to amplify some of the really important issues that we face in this context. And I'd like to thank our, our audience for great questions again and uh, encourage all of you to uh, join us again. Uh, we should have uh, two webinars in uh, November also. And uh, with that, I will uh, close this and say thank you very much. Goodbye now.